Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a beautiful day. It is cold, but it's a beautiful day here. So welcome and thank you for for your attendance. I, I just want to say I'm so proud to be part uh, of our team here at Rush. I, I don't think I've worked with more uh, conscientious, skilled, and, and determined surgeons in, in my career, and I, I just feel uh, very grateful for that and for what we can uh, do for our patients. Um, the first part of my talk will uh, review um, some of the uh, um, treatments and evaluation and statistics of tracheal malignancies. Um, we'll go over some of the treatment options. And then the last part of the, my talk will uh, focus on a, a specific patient uh, which who really highlights how a multidisciplinary team can come together and, and really expertly take care of this uh, patient with an advanced malignancy. So uh, tracheal tremors are rare. Um, it's 0.1 and uh, 0.1 people and 100,000 persons per year. 90% uh, of them are malignant in adults as opposed to children where most are not malignant. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocystic cancer comprise about two thirds of all tracheal tumors. Uh, the, the rest is sort of a mixed bag of other salivary tumors, um, small cell cancers um, and the like. Um, we must also understand that most tumors in the trachea are a result of uh, <laughs> adjacent structures. Um, I, I will say um, the uh, CT scan on the right side is an example of a patient that presented with hemoptysis. And um, a CT scan showed a, a, a what ended up being a well-differentiated papillary cell cancer uh, invading into the trachea. Uh, the patient underwent a thyroidectomy, tracheal resection, and reanastomosis, and uh, is continuing to do quite well. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, two basic types in, um, of tracheal tumors, squamous cell carcinoma associated with smoking, and some are associated with prior radiation. Men are uh, affected two to four more times than women, and usually occur in the later decades of life. Uh, these cancers can be aggressive and are more rapidly symptomatic in general. On the opposite end, adenocystic cancer is not associated with smoking, and slightly more women are affected with, with this tumor. All age ranges are, um, are reported, and the average age is about 56. These tumors generally are very slow growing, and therefore um, their symptom onset is, is more gradual. Um, and often mysterious. Some of the uh, symptoms and signs of someone with a tracheal tumor, it, I, I think many of us by now have seen a patient with uh, sort of quote unquote asthma and we've um, uh, discovered that, you know, they've actually don't have asthma, they have biphasic stridor. Um, and I think it's important to understand the difference, um, at least the way I was taught. Uh, if someone is wheezing, you hear that through a stethoscope. If you hear somebody breathing in and out loudly, uh, you know, through uh, that you can hear it with your ears, that, that's strider, or at least upper airway, large airway resistance noises. Uh, some of the other uh, symptoms are coughing, shortness of breath, of course, and hemoptysis. Uh, the workup is is fairly straightforward. Um, CT scans are are very important to uh, help determine the level. Um, endoscopic biopsy, if feasible um, and safe, uh, is done to get a tissue diagnosis. Um, airway management uh, can be complex and actually deserves a whole um, sort of lecture in and of itself of how to manage these patients' airways. Um, uh, in general, you you do what. Um, uh, should be done at the time. If someone is is uh, an extremist, then you know you must almost always get a surgical airway. Some some patients we've been able to debulk the tumor and and have a more uh, methodical workup. Um, some patients uh, will right away go on ECMO. So um, uh, there's uh, various different ways to uh, manage the airway. Some of the treatment outcomes for squamous cell cancer, I mean, the, the median survival is actually dismal uh, of 10 months, uh, a, a one year overall survival of 43%, and, and in 10 years, only 6% of patients are actually alive. Um, adenocystic, on the other hand, has a median overall survival of almost 10 years, and a, and a very optimistic five year overall survival of 70%, and 10 year uh, goes down 
to 47%, and that's usually from distant disease. Um, now, we have found that improved survival in patients with tracheal adenocystic cancer is associated with a surgery, and a surgery with or without post-op radiation. Uh, it is also associated with private insurance, patients without insurance, um, as with other multiple diseases uh, in our patients that we take care of, um, do less well. Uh, there is also a clear association of improved survival when the patients like these are treated at a higher volume academic center. Some, some important steps of uh, treatment, um, complete sur surgical resection, of course, is our goal. Um, many times our patients will need radiation, postoperative radiation, or even chemoradiation in the case of patients with squamous cell cancer for microscopic positive margins, especially with adenocystic, it is difficult to clear a, mitros a microscopic margin. Some important points of tracheal resection and reanastomosis, um, you know, after, after the skin is open and you've uh, uh, retracted the strap muscles, um, I do always find the recurrent laryngeal nerves. Um, I, I know I've seen it described that if you just stay right next to the trachea, you, you, you will preserve them. Um, we, I, I always um, try to find them to be safe. And, and in that uh, line of thinking, we, to the best of our ability, we always try to do a flexible laryngoscopy prior to surgery to just ascertain mobility of the vocal cords. One of the most important points of tracheal resection and reanastomosis is a tension-free suture line. And that can be done for a defect between two and three centimeters without release procedures. Uh, importantly, the maximum length that you can you, uh, resect is 6.4 centimeters, which is about a little over half of the trachea, length of the trachea, or 13 uh, rings. And, and this is done with release procedures, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, remember, neck flexion is, is important. Um, I used to always put a grillo stitch in, and if those of you who don't know, uh, a grillo stitch is when a stitch is placed between the chin and the upper chest to prevent the patient from extending their neck. Um, uh, we do our utmost to keep the suture, suture knots outside of the lumen so there's no granulation tissue during uh, treatment. And uh, um, traction sutures, which I'll show you a, a picture in a minute, are very important. Um, this is a plate from one of the old uh, uh, surgical atlases, and um, when, when we take out um, uh, tracheal stenoses, the, some of the steps are very much like what we would do for a tracheal um, resection uh, for malignancy. Um, often, if the patient can be intubated, um, there's two sets, two circuits, two sets of hookups. One is the oral endotracheal tube is what, and one is the endotracheal tube through the distal stump. Um, once the posterior wall is um, repaired, then you can advance that uh, oral endotracheal tube into the distal lumen. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but um, this is just uh, what is important about keeping the tension off of the exact suture line. Uh, with these um, retention sutures, as, as I call them. Um, and keeping the tension off is very, very important to help prevent dehiscence and um, uh, stenosis afterwards. Some of the release procedures are you can, you know, mobilize the inferior trachea, you can release the hilum, you can incise the annular ligaments, you can perform an infrahyoid or suprahyoid release, and again, this is an old, a plate from the old Luray um, surgical atlas that shows you the different amounts of length that you can, uh, you can gain uh, with these different release procedures. Um, here's a little diagram of how uh, an infrahyoid release is done. The superior cornu of the thyroid cartilage is released, and the thyrohyoid membrane um, is in size, and that'll drop you down about a um, one and a half to two centimeters. Uh, the infra or the suprahyoid release, pardon me, is completed by first releasing the suprahyoid um, attachments and then um, transecting the greater cornu of the hyoid bone, and then that allows about a two centimeter drop. There are other reconstructive methods. Again, each of these probably deserve a, a separate lecture in and of themselves. Um, uh, tracheal transplant is not routinely done, but it um, and in our patients with malignancy who really shouldn't be immunocompromised, that's not 
not a very good option for for our patients. Uh, there are prefabricated um, tracheas, um, and they're not very successful because most of them just stenose down afterwards. So uh, usually we're left with um, um, the patient's own tissues to help to help reconstruct. Uh, complications can be um, legion, um, but the most common ones are stenosis or dehiscence. Um, again, it's uh, many of the patients, especially those that have the release procedures, may have swallowing problems afterwards. And that that's um, uh, part of what I'm going to highlight in the second part of the talk is that we need our multi multidisciplinary team. We need our speech therapist to help our patients and study our patients after their resection so they uh, gain functional swallowing. So the surgery of complex lesions um, uh, involves multidisciplinary care, as you'll see today. There's been advancement of surgical and anesthetic techniques that allows us to be successful. And there's improved technology. And all of those factors together allow us to perform complex tracheal resections and reanastomoses. So uh, this is the second part of the talk. I just wanted to uh, present um, our patient um, with an advanced malignancy, a 47-year-old woman who had a one-year history of dysphagia. She never had shortness of breath. Uh, she had an esophagoscopy and biopsy, which showed adenocystic cancer. Um, you can see right just above the cricoid, this looks like normal um, uh, posterior pharyngeal wall. Just below the cricoid, you start seeing uh, the bulk of the mass. And a sagittal view shows you the length of this mass, which is uh, fairly imp impressive, involving uh, circumferentially the esophagus and the back wall of the trachea. Importantly, we sort of capitalize on the, on the fact that the anterior tracheal wall was, was not involved. Here's some um, other uh, CT scans depicting the tumor. So our goals of the surgery were complete uh, tumor removal, uh, we wanted to provide um, preservation of her larynx. It would have been probably just easier to do a laryngectomy on this 47-year-old woman, but uh, we uh, we were striving not to do that for the patient so she wouldn't have a, a permanent stoma, and to provide a functional airway. Um, our plan was esophagectomy and gastric pull-up. Um, we planned for tracheal resection, cricotracheal anastomosis, and reconstruction of the posterior uh, tracheal wall. And we knew, um, you know, going in into the surgery that ECMO would be required. Now, this next slide is, is a video. Um, Audrey Pendleton, our thoracic fellow, put this together. She actually published this um, patient's case um, in Annals of Thoracic Surgery. She did a spectacular job with this video. Let's, oops. Began the procedure I'll try to skip through a little bit. Creating a gastric conduit. Because so I'm doing okay on time, I think. For the neck portion, as seen from the superior view, a collar incision was used and dissection was carried down to the trachea in the standard fashion. So this is the proximal trachea, and we're trans you know, we're resecting the posterior trachea wall with the underlying esophagus was placed on ECMO and the trachea was opened. The esophageal mass was identified invading into the posterior wall of the trachea, which along with the cervical esophagus was dissected in order to free the specimen. The specimen was elevated into the wound. Both recurrent laryngeal nerves were found to be encased in the tumor and had to be removed with the specimen. I just wanted to add there, we did um, uh, ANSA hypoglossy to recurrent laryngeal nerve um, anastomosis here. And again, I didn't sort of anticipate there would be vocal cord movement, but we wanted to maintain tone of the vocal cords, which, which we were able to. The trachea had been trans transected proximally between rings one and two. Normal trachea was identified at ring seven. The anterior tracheal wall is seen after the specimen is removed. The conduit was brought up through the chest, and a single layer of anastomosis was created between the cervical esophagus and the gastric conduit. Omental fat is used as a buttress over the anastomosis.
the anterior tracheal wall it was evaluated for eventual again this is the basically the bottom part of the cricoid and this is the tracheal wall anastomosis the right supraclavicular fascial flap is was then mobilized A Doppler was used to listen to the supraclavicular arterial signal, which will be the blood supply to the flap. The flap was deepithelialized using sharp dissection. Now, if you can imagine it, this is this is the posterior tracheal wall. Now, that's what that's what that uh, vascularized tissue is. The flap was rotated on its pedicle and sutured to the trachea to construct the posterior wall of the trachea. Careful attention was paid so that there was no redundant flap at the posterior wall. Attention was then turned to the anterior tracheal reconstruction. The anterior trachea is measured and cut to create a tension-free anastomosis. Rings three and four were removed. So this is the um, mobilized uh, supraclavicular eyelid flap that's deepithelialized. This is the posterior tracheal wall. And then you'll see here that um, of the we just put everything together. Orbital sutures in an interrupted fashion. And again, she's on ECMO, obviously, this whole time. <laughs> An endotracheal tube was placed through the tracheal defect. The skin was then closed. Muscle and fascia. Flake drains were placed on either side adjacent to the conduit and reconstructed. So that, that was um, the end. The patient overall did well. There was... Um, a few interesting complications. She had a, a pulmonary hemorrhage still. We don't understand uh, quite why that happened, but um, uh, she went on to get uh, post-operative radiation and, and uh, really serendipitously, I just saw her yesterday and she had she had, had scans about two months ago. Um, you can see on this uh, CT scan, here's the vocal cords. You might wonder what this is. We had actually injected her vocal cords. Um, I think it was alloderm or something, I can't remember. Uh, just to bring them more medially so she could have a voice. Here, of course, is a conduit. Here's the trachea, of course. Here's a sagittal view um, of her. You can see how smooth uh, the posterior tracheal wall is. You actually might notice that there's a little bit <laughs> of a stenosis here, which um, uh, developed um, over the months after radiation. We had brought her to the operating room uh, earlier this month and dilated that area. Um, during her recovery, she maintained a small stoma. Uh, she is ready to get that small tracheocutaneous fistula closed. Um, and here's, uh, I, for some reason, I couldn't get this video uploaded, but this is uh, a view of the subglottis. You can see some scar bands, and this is actually where the uh, supraclavicular island flap was sutured to the posterior cricoid area. Here's her subglottic view. This is the skin of her stoma. This is the direct posterior uh, uh, trachea wall, and this is the, the distal trachea looking down. And here's just a final uh, little video of her. So, uh, I should just uh, maybe cover the stoma, just breathe in and out. So you don't hear Strider. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that she's breathing well with her stoma occluded. So, you know, it, it takes a remarkable patient to take the leap of faith and, and um, undergo this sort of uh, complex procedure. She is a well woman, um, but it, this um, wonderful patient and um, really highlights what a multidisciplinary team can provide uh, for someone with a really advanced um, tumor. She's 18 months out now and, and uh, 
you know, anticipate that she'll continue to do well. And like I said, we'll, we'll close up that uh, tracheocutaneous fistula. Um, I hope I didn't run over time, Nikki, and, and I am all done. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Um, I'm going to continue on with um, talking about bronchial malignancy um, and so and how we treat it. I need to give some credit to um, kind of our godfather of thoracic surgery, Dr. Penfield Faber, um, who provided a lot of the illustrations for this talk from his original manuscripts. Um, and it's just kind of cool to see um, the continuity of care from 30 years ago to now, um, and then what we have done innovative uh, to, to continue on with this topic. Um, so I'm talking about um, malignancy from the level of the carina down through the, the bronchioles. Um, this illustration here delineates the central area of the tumor. The dashed line um, indicates the area central uh, to the bronchial tree, and the red area is um, the area that um, is within two centimeters in, in any direction to um, a critical mediastinal structure. And those are the things that um, we need to consider when we're considering surgical resection for these types of tumors. Um, there's two main uh, groups of tumors that fall into this category. The first is your standard non-small cell lung cancer. There's a predominance of older individuals um, in this category, and these patients are generally in the range of 60 to 65 years old. There's a squamous cell predominance to these type of tumors. Um, they usually have a higher involvement of um, lymph node metastasis. Um, and for that reason, um, bronchoscopic evaluation and mediastinal staging is supremely important in these tumors. Um, obviously, there's a higher incidence of smokers um, and um, parenchymal sparing procedures are often not um, possible. However, it's something to consider. This photo here, um, we're looking down uh, the right main stem bronchus from a rigid bronchoscope. Um, this area here is looking into the bronchus intermedius, and here you see a large squamous cell tumor um, that's emanating from the um, orifice of the right upper lobe. The next subset of uh, tumors are bronchial carcinoids or your neuroendocrine tumors. Um, these tumors represent approximately 1% to 2% of all lung malignancies. Um, there usually is a predominance in younger patients and some evidence of female predominance in those patients less than 40 years old. Um, an atypical histology is often associated with smoking, typical histology not so much, um, and 10% of these tumors are located in the main bronchi. Um, most of these patients are asymptomatic when they present, um, and it's often an incidental finding um, when they do present with this tumor. Um, so surgery for these types of tumors the main, is the mainstay with the goal of being um, negative surgical margins and parenchymal sparing procedures. Um, we can see from this um, schematic of the airway that the technical considerations are that on the right side, we have a short right main stem bronchus. On the left side, we have a long left main stem bronchus. And then on the right, we have the additional length of our bronchus intermedius, which we do not find on the left side. This is from one of Dr. Faber's original papers indicating the rush experience um, with um, the location of uh, bronchial malignancies. Um, and the mainstay being sleeve resection. This just indicates that we take the parenchyma along with a portion of the airway, including the tumor, and create an anastomosis uh, to bring the two back together. To illustrate this concept, I'm gonna discuss a right upper lobe sleeve lobectomy, um, which indicates the first screen with the non-small cell lung cancer, a tumor in the orifice of the right upper lobe. In order to obtain a negative surgical margin, um, the uh, proximal right main stem bronchus is transected uh, along with uh, just uh, distal to the orifice of the right upper lobe on the bronchus intermedius. These two areas are then brought back together and reanastomose after the parenchymal resection is complete. Um, this here is an uh, intraoperative photo through a traditional thoracotomy. Um, Azagus vein, uh, superior vena cava, 
This is the cut edge of the right main stem bronchus. The upper lobe has been surgically removed. Um, this is the cut edge of the bronchus intermedius, um, and this is the remainder of the lung parenchyma. On the right side, we can see that the anastomosis has been performed. Um, this is the uh, connection from the right main stem to that cut edge of the bronchus intermedius. Um, this is posterior, um, this is anterior, the remainder of the lung, the lower lobe, the middle lobe. And again, this is through a traditional thoracotomy. You can see that the ribs have been spread and there's a chest spreader within the chest. We now have the ability to perform these operations via minimally invasive technique. This can be done via video assisted techniques, uh, also known as VATS. Um, and this video uh, highlights a robotic technique of the same operation. So here we can see that the azagous vein has been looped. This is the same view as the photos. You can see the flexible bronchoscope within the airway of the right main stem bronchus. Here we've advanced to um, cutting the right main stem bronchus, um, and this will expose the tumor in a second here. So you can start to see the tumor um, coming into view um, within the airway. You can see along the posterior wall that there's the tumor. The right upper lobe airway is to the left just by that blue vessel loop. You can see the endotracheal tube in the proximal trachea. And here we complete the transection. The next step is to reanastomose the, the proximal right uh, main stem to the bronchus intermedius. This can be done in multiple ways. Um, here it's shown in a running fashion. It can be completed with simple interrupted sutures as well. S similar to what Dr. Stenson discussed, you know, we need a tension free anastomosis. Once the anastomosis is complete, um, they can be covered with either um, uh, fat uh, from within the mediastinum or muscle um, buttress um, if, if we're concerned about um, the, the tension or the um, integrity of the anastomosis, which most often we are not. Um, so that's the completion of the video. Um, so, while surgery remains the mainstay of technique, we also need to include bronchoscopic interventions. Um, these interventions are most important um, either for a couple of reasons. One, in the candidate who is not appropriate for surgery um, and an obstructing lesion, bronchoscopic interventions can debulk the lesion um, and eliminate the post-obstructive pneumonia um, that is occurring. Um, there's also some role um, in um, debulking um, prior to surgery um, to aid uh, with eliminating post-obstructive pneumonia, but also to uh, allow better visualiz visualization of the airway itself. Um, and then on the rare occasion, some of the neuroendocrine tumors may be on a pedunculated stalk. Um, and in very, very rare occasions, it may be possible um, to remove the tumor in its entirety um, by uh, a bronchoscopic intervention. Um, this does require very close surveillance in the follow-up period uh, to um, evaluate for recurrence. So the rigid bronchoscope um, is very helpful um, in this situation. Here we see a patient. This is the rigid bronchoscope uh, entering through the mouth. We do sometimes use a combination of the flexible bronchoscope and also a, a, a separate camera a specific for the rigid bronchoscope to, to um, allow better visualization. Um, here is uh, an uh, endoscopic view of an obstructing lesion in the airway. There's multiple tumor ablation techniques. Um, one is with a laser. Um, we also can use argon plasma coagulation or cryoablation to ablate the tumor. Um, in the photo to the right, you can see 
um, that uh, the airway is, is visualized past this tumor, which has been um, started to be cored out. Um, this uh, video is uh, demonstrating the cryoablation technique, uh, removing a large uh, pedunculated tumor from the airway. And in this video, um, we can see the argon plasma coagulation um, being demonstrated. Um, this um, modality uh, has the ability to uh, coagulate as well as ablate uh, the endobronchial tumor. We do have to work closely with our anesthesia colleagues when performing these procedures um, it, uh, in order to uh, maximize ventilation but also minimize um, the oxygenation in the field. Um, this image um, shows an endobronchial stent. This is the patient that um, we showed in the beginning. Um, the tumor has been completely cored out and a self-expanding covered stent has been placed. Um, this stent um, will um, uh, stay in place uh, for the entirety of a patient's uh, post-operative treatment or pre-operative treatment, whatever the case may be. These are often palliative techniques to allow patency of the airway um, during treatment. Um, I thank you all for joining and um, Dr. Stenson and I will open for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Geisen and Dr. Stenson. Those are excellent presentations. Um, uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, one from Dr. Dickover uh, is, uh, was the cryoablation that uh, you just showed, uh, Dr. Geisen, done by thoracic surgery or interventional pulmonology? Um, so both thoracic surgery and interventional pulmonology in our institution uh, perform cryoablation. We often work uh, uh, together on these procedures. Um, and so Dr. Katzis is our interventional pulmonologist. Um, and um, just as the um, uh, ENT doctors and ourselves um, collaborate, we collaborate with it, IP as well um, for these types of procedures. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, one other, one other question. Um, so, for Dr. Stenson, are are there certain patients that you wouldn't consider doing a tracheal resection on uh, that are that are higher risk? Are there certain uh, contraindications when you're looking at a patient that you'd say, well, this is way too high risk. I wouldn't do uh, tracheal resection on you, assuming that you could get it done with attention free anastomosis. Um, I mean. Of late, in the past year or 18 months or so, we're, we're seeing an influx of um, patients who have been intubated or treated who have COVID um, or had COVID. Um, and most of them are so weak that um, as much as they want their trach tube out, and um, uh, I, I wait till they're walking. <laughs> or um, our most recent gentleman, I, I, I asked him to get pulmonary function tests, which Typically, I won't if they're if they're quite active, but I just wanted to make sure that this particular patient had enough uh, pulmonary reserve to to pull through um, not a trach, but a, actually uh, what what would turn out to be a normal airway. So, yeah, I mean, aside from the regular surgical contraindications, um, they have to. Uh, not be a pulmonary cripple, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and they have to uh, not be deconditioned. So I've got another lady who I met her six months ago. She was bed bound. I just saw her two weeks ago, um, and she um, was in a wheelchair sitting up and was starting to walk. And I told her to come back in six weeks. If you're walking, I'll, I'll get your trach out. <laughs> so sure. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reason I ask is there, you know, we have question, patients that come through who maybe are previously radiated in the neck or are on the ventilator or, you know, or uh, maybe steroids. Are are any of those absolute contraindications for you or not really? 
Um, probably not a ventilator. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, we've rep we've repaired big TE fistulas on patients on ventilators. That's a different situation. Um, but radiation, I wouldn't necessarily say is a strong, you know, stop. Um, I would do, uh, you know, whatever I could to make sure that the proximal and distal ends were vascularized. And if it was um, a little questionable, I'd make sure to surround it with some um, uh, vascularized tissue, whether that's a free flap or a, a pec flap. Um, I, yeah, the it would also be... Yeah, I think every patient is different, and as long as their pulmonary reserve is okay, they're um, and they're and they're not deconditioned. Um, we try to mitigate any diabetes or uh, um, vascular disease by making sure they have good nutrition and um, and have the whole team have the whole team there. Um, Dr. Stenson, Dr. Gason, those were fantastic talks, uh, amazing videos. Um, I just have a question for Dr. Stenson. Uh, how do you approach sometimes these patients? Uh, I think in the case you presented ended up having bilateral vocal cord uh, involvement. Um, how do you approach cases uh, which we encounter sometimes with tracheal stenosis but also have an underlying vocal cord paralysis, maybe unilateral? Does that impact anything on how you approach potentially? Um that that's actually a pretty common scenario in patients with the the long segment stenoses, um, and um, I still try to find uh, the vocal the recurrent laryngeal nerves. I mean, there's been a couple of times when I just haven't been able to find it in the, in the dense scar. Um, I think the so I find the the nerves and just make sure that um, they've got a good uh, cuff leak before they're extubated. Um, I think the sort of the more challenging situation if they have a posterior glottic stenosis or, or have bilateral immobility of the cords, then then in general, all the patients want to do is just talk. So we get them talking first, you know, clear the obstruction, get them talking first. And then after uh, the stenosis is healed, then we'll do a cordotomy um, and allow you know, get them to be, get to the point that they can be decannulated. Yeah. So and, uh, I don't know if that yeah, answers. Those are, those are great answers. And then um, I think uh, Dr. Cedar was asking about, uh, you know, complex cases or uh, cases that have maybe had radiation or, or other issues. So what I've, um, when we encountered those kind of scenarios and the stenosis is so severe that the patients are just unable to talk and it's, it's really problematic. Uh, we've gone ahead and, uh, excise the stenosis transcervically like you described, but then maybe put a small distal airway, um, you know, a very small trach. I know that's kind of uh, opposite what we always talk about, you know, taking the irritation, but in a, in a high risk situation, putting a very small tube distally, allowing things exactly. to heal and then decannulate. So that's been, and then those patients are happy because they're able to phonate, the airway is right. a little easier to manage, and then you can work over time with your, uh, with our team various approaches, um, try to open up any other stenosis and, and then kind of decannulate at a later date. So Yeah. A lot of times good. I'll put a, a T-tube in those situations if I, I you know. Yep. Um, those are yeah, a T-tube or a distal trach, yep. I'd like to, you know, highlight that, uh, you know, in that video that Dr. Stenson showed, um, you know, that patient was placed on ECMO. And Dr. Geisen, you showed that video of uh, pulling out a, you know, <laughs> what looked like a golf ball sized tumor, um, you know, and relatively high risk, um, you know, endobronchial uh, 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 resections. Um, how do you decide, uh, Dr. Geisen, when you guys are going to use ECMO or, um, or go ahead without ECMO? Um, I think that we have a discussion with our cardiac colleagues, first of all, and as well as anesthesia. So it's a team approach. Um, and, you know, the, if we're concerned at all about losing the airway, um, you know, the, the, the concern with bringing out such a large piece of tumor, um, as in that video, is that it falls off and lodges um, in the contralateral side, at which point you won't be able to ventilate the patient. Um, and so if there's any type of concern at all that the airway would become a problem, um, then the safest route is to go on ECMO.